don't. Ooh. All right, good afternoon. Hope everybody's doing well. Welcome to day two of module nine, lesson four. So we're gonna continue working on the notebook, the course arc um, and stuff. So go ahead and get those open from um, our last meeting. If you missed that meeting, um, if you weren't in class on Tuesday, then you'll need to go back to the live session page, right? And watch um, that lesson to get that portion of um, the notebook done. I think we got one through four done, okay? Um, so we're gonna continue with our learning intention, evaluate and assess um, taxes at the local, state, and federal level, okay? So there's three different levels that we see of taxes. Federal level, which is where we pay income tax. Um, every check you get, right, they take, they take those taxes out, or when you get a job, they will. Um, state taxes, which we can pay either in um, as a flat tax, like an income tax, like in the state of Oregon or something like that, or a sales tax. So in Nevada, we we pay a sales tax. So everybody pays the same amount of sales tax, just depend or percentage, I should say, sorry, just depending on what you buy. And then we pay local taxes, right? We pay that through gas, through our utilities, on um, you know service fees. Every time I pay my electric bill, my gas bill, my um, water bill, you know, there's taxes and fees built into those um, that the local areas then reap from. Also, when people own a house or a property, they pay property tax on that. That also then goes to the local level. So that would be county or city. So lots of different ways. Sometimes we don't even realize that we are paying taxes. All right. So hopefully you're geared up, ready, just like Cartman um, and stuff. So there were four major vocab words that we went over yesterday. Proportional tax. So that is um, where everyone pays the same proportion. So like sales tax would be a good example of that. It's the same percentage for everybody, right? When you go buy something, you pay the 8.25%. Um, withholding. So all of us, when we get that job and that paycheck, they withhold the federal taxes from our paycheck before we ever get the paycheck. Tax deductions, this is when you go file. And when you file your taxes, that's federal level. Okay, that's federal level when you go file your taxes. When we file those taxes, we're trying to find ways to save money, everybody, all right? So tax deductions are ways you can save money on your taxes, all right? And that'll be different for different people depending on your, your living situation, where you live, if you have kids, your marital status, on um, the type of job you have, on um, how much money you make. There's a lot of different things that then dictate what tax deductions you can or cannot get. And then progressive tax. So if you're looking at your notebook, right, progressive tax, we went over. And um, that is the more money you make, the more they take. So our federal taxes, so state tax is proportional. It's everyone pays the same percentage, okay? So for us, that sales tax, some states that would be income tax, flat tax, right? 10% or 8% or whatever that percentage is. Progressive tax is where we're going to pick up today, all right, and help understand how progressive tax works. Basically, the more you make, the more they take. So the higher your everybody pays, but as you get into different brackets of income, then the percentage that they will tax you on that bracket goes up. So we're going to spend some time today um, going over that, okay? Let me go back over to this. All right. All right. So just the end of the quarter is coming here pretty quick. So I'm just going to reiterate this a lot in class because, again, I don't want to hear, I didn't know, you didn't give me time. Like, those, that's just not true, okay? So the zombie apocalypse closes on the 19th, so that's this coming Monday, okay, that we don't have school. That closes. That's that two weeks. So that's that double window where you already got double the time, all right? So it will not be reopened, okay, because it's already, it's a one-week late window. There's double the time, so when it closes, it closes, and then module nine, lesson three, course arc notebook quiz. Those are open for another week and a half. And then on um, this coming Tuesday, that's when the module nine, lesson four, course arc notebook and quiz are due. All right. So just realizing that we're coming to it here pretty quick. All right. Really quick in the chat. Let's see if you've been paying attention. What are the three levels of taxation? What are the three levels? I'll give you a hint. The highest level is federal. There's two smaller than that. So if there's federal, what's the next level down? State. Very good, Ladybug. Yes, state. Okay, very good. All right, even more, more smaller than that. So it goes federal, which is the whole United States, state, which is our individual state, then what's the smallest? Anybody? What's the smallest? Think utilities, property taxes, where do those fees go? Where do those taxes go? They don't go to the state. They don't go to the federal. Who gets that money? Which government, though? Come on, folks. 
Okay, but which government? No, state, so state, so state is the mid-level. So we have federal, which is the large level, state, which is the mid-level. What is the most small level? Think about when you're writing your address. What do you put before, when you're writing your address, like on an envelope or something like that? You don't just put the state. What else do you have to put so they can find you? The country. Wait, oh, oh my goodness. The town. It's okay. You meant county probably, right? You meant county. Um, yes, very good, Sasha. Yes, so town or county. Okay, good. So the three levels are federal, which they withhold from our check, state, which you could either pay in a flat tax or sales tax. We pay sales tax. It depends on the state. And then you have the local level, which would be town and good size of town and county. Okay. And we pay that through property taxes. We pay that through our utility bills, through gas tax. So there's all these different smaller taxes then that go to the local level. All right. So when you're thinking of taxes, don't just think federal. There are taxes everywhere um, around us. Almost everything we pay for has a tax built in and then goes to different levels depending on which tax it is. All right, so we're gonna continue with the course arc in the notebook. So let's go ahead, go ahead and get your notebook open for me. Okay, so we did, we looked at the importance of having a tax that without having a tax, we wouldn't have common functioning um, things provided by the government, like, you know, defense, highways, education, first responders, um, you know, so we need taxes on some level, okay? We, we need it for social security, Medicare, for the elderly, veteran services. There's a lot of things, um, subsidized housing. There's a lot of things that we need the government for. They help provide general services to the public or for segments of the population, maybe that are more vulnerable or have higher need. So this is why we consent. We consent to pay taxes because we benefit from it. We lived in an organized society. We can travel on nice roads. We want our kids to go to nice schools. You know, we want the general quality of life. And through our tax money, the government at least can set up a baseline for that. They can't improve every element of your life, but they can hopefully set up, you know, nice spaces, parks, things like that, right? So that we can enjoy the place with which we live. OK, so we're going to continue with um, going into number five. So let's have our, this open. Let's also let's go into Canvas. And get into our proper shell. And we're going to go to modules and we're going to relaunch the course arc. So we're going to go to 9.4. And then we're going to relaunch the course arc. OK. Click that tab and get that open, okay? All right, let me know once you have both of those open. Oh, wow, so 8,000, that's a small town. That's a really small town. That's a really small town. <laughs> that's, that's like the size where everybody knows everybody's secrets. Like there nothing is and half the town's probably related to people, right? <laughs> Right, there is no keeping a secret. Whatever the drama is, everybody knows it, right? <laughs> when you're in that small town. Okay, let's get a few more thumbs up that you have the course arc and you have the notebook open for me. Yeah, yeah, right? Nothing is safe. Hmm. Pros and cons to small towns. I personally love small towns. I would move to a small town like that in a heartbeat. I love more rural, less people. Just, I feel like less people, less problems. That's personally my feeling and stuff like that. But it, it there is nice things about being in a larger city, right? All the things you can do, the amenities, um, things like that. But personally, I, I do really like the small town, the small town vibe. All right. Awesome. So we left off yesterday. All right. And we were, we left off on understanding taxes, understanding why we have them and what purpose they serve. Right. Okay. And we watched, um, a little bit on the history of that with the American Revolution, Civil War. And basically the trend is that with each war, the government says they need more money, which in times of war, they do need more money for defense. War is very expensive. But the problem is after the wars, they don't really go back to the way it was before. They they raise it for the war and then they just keep it there. And you're like, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> like I thought the war was over. So the struggle we have now in the debate we have now is 
when and how much is enough tax, right? And that's going to come. We all agree there has to be some tax, but then where you get into debate is how much should the government provide? How much do people deserve to keep their paychecks? How much of your your happiness and security is your responsibility versus the government's responsibility? And the more pressure you put on the government, then the more they're going to tax everybody else. Do you see what I mean? So it's it's a fine line. Do you want to pay for other people to live? And if so, how much? Okay. So um, I think we had number five before I show the video. Let me look at this. Yes. Okay. So explain the impact of taxation in the United States economy. So um, taxpayers pay sales tax on goods and services. Um, they get taxes withheld from their checks. Um, our lives kind of revolve around taxes, it feels like, you know, every element of our life. And if you think about it, we get taxed on the same dollar over and over and over again. All right. So here's number five. Okay. And I'll pin that. All right, so there's number five. So the government impacts the economy through goods and services it purchases and provides. About one third of the nation's economy is based on government spending. So the government does, they put money back into the economy. Um, for instance, like um, paying for road jobs, paying for education. You know, I am I am considered paid by the government, right? So I am employed because of the government. On um, people that work on highways or freeways, first responders, on um, Let's see, military. Um, so there's a lot of employment that through tax dollars, there is a lot of employment then by providing goods and services to the public. They employ people to provide those goods and services, right? So example of providing public education. So I am ed I am employed as a teacher through tax dollars to provide help provide the service of public education, right? So what they mean by that is about one third of the jobs in the United States comes from government funded positions. So and that's so that's quite a bit. That's quite a bit when you think about it. Okay, let's take a look at number six, the structure and tax base. Okay, I think this takes us to um, then the video. Good. All right, let's jump back over into course arc. So progressive tax is one of the vocab words we looked at. And that's the way we pay our federal taxes. All right. This graph, I honestly think does such a good job. And then this video I'm going to show you does a really good job of helping to understand progressive tax. So I think most of us can understand the idea of the more you make, the more they take, the higher percentage you pay. What most people don't understand is how that proportion works. So this is where you kind of have to follow along. So if someone makes $25,000, the first tax bracket is you pay 15% until you make $25,000. So anybody who makes $25,000 or less pays 15% tax. Okay, that makes sense. Then we jump to the person that makes $75,000. The next bracket is from $25,000 to $75,000. So that bracket of $50,000, $25,000 to $75,000 is taxed at 25%. So if let's say I made $75,000, I don't pay all of my income at 25. The first $25,000 I make in the year is paid at 15%. And then the next $50,000 I make is paid at 25%. So not all 75 is taxed at 25%, only the last 50,000, the part that fits into that bracket. So in the same way, someone who makes 100,000, they actually technically pay three different tax rates. The first $25,000 they make in a year is taxed at 15%. The next 50,000 they make is at 25%. Then the last 25, so that 75 to 100 is taxed at 30%. And it just keeps going higher and higher but everyone pays the same percent on that certain bracket. What changes is, is the more brackets you fall into, then the higher percent you pay in that bracket. Does that make sense? Give me a thumbs up if that makes sense. So you're not paying 30% on the entire $100,000. You're paying the same percent as other people. It's just as you graduate out of those tax brackets, you pay then only on that portion of your income. Okay. So it's, it can be a little confusing, but I feel like the visual helps, correct? I think the visual really helps of understanding that concept. So let's watch this video. I think they also do a really good job of helping understand proportional tax and, um, and how that works. Okay. Oh, really quick. So the question is, to check your understanding and mastery of the concept in the graph, what percentage of total income does each earner show in the graph? Okay, so here showing each income earner, they pay 15, 21, and 20. Okay, it should be 15, 25, and 30%. All right, the correct answer is 15%. Oh, everyone pays 15%. Okay, so that with the example, sorry, I was reading that wrong. 
on um, with all three examples, all three pay at the 15%. Then the next two pay at the 25 and then the third person pays at the 30%. But all three making an income are paying at that 15%. So that's part of where some people really push that the, the progressive is fair because for each bracket of income you make, everyone is paying the same percentage. Just if you continue to make more than you pay, you graduate out of those brackets into others. So let's watch this quick video. These are tax brackets for 2019. Simple, right? But many of us make a common mistake when looking at this. Let's say my income is $84,000. You might think that puts me in the third bracket, so I would owe the federal government 22% of my income. This is wrong, and it's causing us to have uninformed debates about tax policy. Here's how it actually works. Let's go back to my $84,000 income. Now, instead of thinking of tax rates as brackets, we should think of them as pockets. But first, there's one special pocket we need to talk about. The money we put in this pocket is not taxed. The government automatically lets single people put $12,000 in this special pocket and more for couples. But if you spend a lot of money on things like medical expenses or charitable donations, you can sometimes put in more. These are called deductions. With the $70,000 that's left over, we can start filling up the pockets. The first pocket only has room for $9,700, so I only pay 10% on this money. Then I pay 12% on the money in the next pocket. And then 22% on the money in this pocket. These are called marginal tax rates, and that's how these brackets actually work. So if I get a raise, that new money goes into the first pocket with empty space. When space runs out, we put it in the next pocket. So the raise, and only the raise, would be partially taxed at 22% and partially at 24%. So when politicians say they want to raise the top tax rate, doesn't necessarily mean these pockets and their money are affected. They're talking about tax rates on the pockets way over there, which are only used once people have filled in these smaller ones. Marginal tax rates are a pretty simple concept once you get the hang of it. So the next time a politician says the government wants to take away 70% of your income, just send them this video. Taxes are a great example of how politicians manipulate people and both sides do it. Democrats, Republicans, everybody does it. Okay. All politicians do it. But taxes are one of those where people, it just like they said, will make a blanket statement that has maybe an element of truth, but is misconstrued in the way it's being presented. And that doesn't mean that it's a good thing if somebody wants to raise taxes. So I'm not defending if somebody wants to raise taxes or lower taxes, but oftentimes we'll take something to an extreme where when you understand the full details of it, maybe it's not as bad or it's not as good as it sounds. Okay. It can kind of go both ways, but oftentimes um, we do see that used by politicians to kind of manipulate the situation um, and stuff when talking taxes is always something people, you know, people love these great ideas and stuff, but oftentimes people vote by their pocketbook, you know, and so taxes can definitely bring people to one side or another side. All right, let's take a look at the, um, at the notebook. Okay. How are progressive, proportional, and regressive taxes similar? How are they different? Use evidence from the text to support your answer. All right, so let's do the first part. So progressive tax um, is a tax that the more you make, the percentage increases, but it's marginal, right? It's on the in total, it's on just that portion of the income that falls into that bracket. So people with higher incomes are gonna pay a higher percentage on their taxes, not only just in the physical dollar, but yes, their percentages are higher, so they are going to pay more. A proportional tax is a tax in which the percentage of income on tax remains the same. So a lot of um, state taxes are that way, income tax or sales tax, right? No matter what I buy, I'm paying the 8.25% just as someone who has no money as somebody who makes $10 million a year if you're living in the state of Nevada. 
And then a regressive tax is a tax where the percentage of income paid to taxes decreases as income increases. This is generally seen in state sales taxes. Um, all of these tax structures are based on levying taxes the way that we pay for some of them. All right, so sometimes you can get a tax break on like more expensive items. Um, for instance, a car, if you trade in a car and then buy a car, sometimes you can get that sales tax reduced or eliminated. Like there's ways you can kind of work around it. So that's one example of kind of what they're talking about. All right, so this is number six. Let's see how much of this it lets me copy over. All right, cut off at levying. So let me go get the rest of this. You see where is levying? There it is. Okay, so I'll just get the last like three sent two sentences and recopy those over for you. Again, this is number six. So if you're watching this video, these pinned comments, or um, you can always pause it um, in order to get your response there. Okay, if we're moving on, it says tax structure and tax base. What is meant when a community is said to have a strong tax base, okay? So a tax base is the income, property, goods, and services are all subject to tax. So a property tax is based on real estate and other properties. Tax base is the sales tax on goods and services. So when a government policymaker creates a new tax, they first decide what is the base, where will that tax take place? Will it be on income? Will it be on property? Will it be a sales tax? Will it be on a certain product? So like when I go to buy gas or when I go, when I go to buy gas at the gas station, I pay a specific gas tax or my electric bill. Like those are specific taxes. Um, so a community has a strong tax base when there's a diverse when there's a diversity of types of taxes. So you have property tax, you have sales tax, you have tax hidden in lots of different ways. So the goal when you're taxing people basically is you don't want to do it all in one area, okay? So let's say all the taxes were in property taxes. So anyone who had a house, they had to pay 5000 or I don't know, some ridiculous amount, $20,000 a year or something like that. Not taxed on anything else, but only that. Do you think that's going to encourage people to want to buy a house? No, right? Because who wants to pay that tax? So it's not a strong tax base because you're driving people away from it. By diversifying where the taxes are, you end up getting probably the same amount, but it, you're you're hitting up more people, if that makes sense. Okay, you're hitting up more people. Um, okay, it cut it off. So that was number seven. Um, and then let me get, so it cut off at being in T. Oh, it literally cut off taxed. Okay, so you can write that part. So being, and then it literally just cut off tax. So when you copy and paste it, just write in taxed. All right. I know, so much effort. I don't know if you can handle it, right? teachers these days, their expectations. That was funny. Come on. That was funny. Thank you, Elena. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So having a good tax base is, the reality is no one sector should be paying all the taxes. Reality is if everybody's living here, everybody should be paying into the system some way, shape, or form. Now, it's fair that some people pay more, right? People who have more money or have more assets and stuff. I think most people agree with that and understand that they they make more, so they sacrifice a little more. But the idea that that only the rich pay taxes, like, is that really fair, right? And that discourages people from wanting to make money. So a good tax base is about creating, when we say fairness, fair doesn't necessarily mean equal, like everyone pays the same tax, but that everyone is being taxed in some way, shape, or form. So again, sales tax is a great example of that. Whether you are um, homeless or you make $10 million a year, you pay sales tax, right? When you go to buy something. So there's there's ways that they hit it so that everyone is paying at least something. And then they find additional ways than the more money you make, the more they'll take, right? So if you buy a nicer car, if you buy a nicer house, if you spend more on certain items, right? You're going to pay more sales tax versus someone who doesn't buy as much or doesn't own a property or things like that. You will pay less taxes. So it's the idea that everyone should pay, but not the same amount, right? And so a good tax base is where you diversify the taxes so that it doesn't hit everybody the same. There's some choice or some, you know, deviation in it, but also like, you know, um, that, if everyone who's living in a society is in some way contributing to that society, which which makes sense in theory. You know what I mean? Okay, so let's move on to the tax burden. Let's 
So we're in Canvas, or sorry, we're in um, the course arc. So who bears the burden? So the reality is that um, everyone in some way, shape or form pays taxes, even people without a job pay taxes in some way, shape or form. If you're paying a utility bill, if you are going and buying something, you're gonna pay a sales tax. So everyone pays a tax somehow. Just, it tends to be that the more people make, the more jobs they have, the more property they own, the more they consume, then the more taxes they will be on the hook for, okay? So the burden, when we say that, the burden is everyone's, but majority of the burden, definitely, the more you make, the more you will pay. Um, and stuff, and that increases just again, the more, the larger your house, the higher your utility bills, the higher your tax, um, the nicer the car, the more you'll pay, the higher the tax, you know, uh, the, the bigger your house, the more property tax. So there's just kind of this idea of the more you consume, then the more tax you should pay. All right. So, um, let's watch this quick video and we'll keep going with our questions. Hey, how you doing? This is Mr. Griffin with ACDC Econ, Key Economic Concepts in 60 Seconds. Could you just ask, your teacher just asked you about uh, the elastic and inelastic range of a demand curve. And we're talking about imperfect competition and how the demand downward sloping, the marginal revenue goes down faster and it looks like this. So marginal revenue is less than the demand. Could the teacher ask you, okay, what part of that demand curve is elastic, which one's inelastic, and how can you tell? Well, the concept I'm going to explain to you in 60 Seconds. The first concept you have to remember is the idea of the total revenue test. We did another video on that one. For elastic demand, we said if the price was here and the price goes down, right? The price goes down, a whole lot more people buy, and we said total revenue increases. When price goes up, total revenue decreases. That's the concept for elastic demand. Over here, when the price goes down for inelastic, well, not that many more people start buying. Price goes down, total revenue goes down. Price goes up, total revenue goes up for inelastic. Take that concept, whoop, transfer it straight over here. Good, when marginal revenue is positive, total revenue is gonna be going up. But since it's marginal revenue is falling, total revenue increases at a decreasing rate. And then it hits a peak right here. And then when the marginal revenue is negative, total revenue starts to fall. That's what the total revenue looks like for monopoly. So if I draw in a vertical straight line, it just shows me the concept. Look right here, from these units produced, from that unit to that unit, the price is going down. If the price is going down, at the same time total revenue is going up, this is the elastic range of the demand curve. Over here, price is falling from here to here, total revenue is falling. Price is going down, total revenue is going down. Where is that? Where is that? Price going down, total revenue going down, boom, right there. That is the inelastic range of the demand curve. Elastic range, inelastic range, done, until next time. All right, we're gonna go to next important characteristics of tax in the course arc. And this is going to, we're gonna get into our last couple questions in the notebook. All right, so uh, important characteristics of tax. tax. So determining equity. So we get into a lot of these concepts with tax. We understand we have to pay tax and understanding the political debate around tax, right? You know, we understand why we have them. We need essentials. We need common use spaces. We need common use services. And someone has to pay for that. So taxes are a way of doing that without each of us getting a bill every month. Here's the highway bill. Here's the hospital bill. Here's the first responder bill. Here's the defense bill. Here's the social security. It just gets taken from us and then they disperse where that money goes, right? So that those goods and services are there, all right? The constant problem or question that we have is how is how do we make it fair? Everyone pays taxes in some way, shape or form, but then how one person defines fairness might be different than another person. Should it be the more you make, the more they take? Um, should it be, um, um, you know, everyone pays the same no matter what so that you're not, um, some people think that that's fair, right? The more you make, the more they take. Some people feel that's not fair. I'm being, if I'm making, um, if I make a huge jump in my income that I'm being penalized for being successful versus someone who um, is not making as much, um, you know, that how is that fair to me because I made it? So some people see it that way. When you look at us in comparison to other countries, it's pretty interesting, all right? So take a look at this graph, all right? 
So us compared to other countries, okay, at their tax rates. So this would be average tax rate. So this isn't like everyone's tax rate, but just the average individual within a country. Okay. We're at about just a little under 20. So we're at about 23%. So us, Japan, Canada, we're right in there in those low 20s. Okay. And so you notice some beneath us, Ireland, South Korea, Mexico, quite lower, 10%. Okay. Then you have countries like Denmark, Germany. Okay, so in Denmark and Germany, here's some of the things that I know that that tax dollar goes for. Okay, um, universal health care, uh, um, ch uh, child care subsidies. You still pay for child care, but it's much, much cheaper than it is here. Um, free college. So college, just like high school, people can continue on and people can do that. So I have a really good friend that lives in Copenhagen in Denmark. So she lives in the capital of Denmark. She has dual citizenship. So she's lived there, I think, full time for about six, seven years. Um, and so, so we were talking about the pros and cons of the higher tax rate because she pays almost double the taxes that I do when you look at her tax rate. And I'll be honest, I'm like, oh my gosh. So it was interesting talking to her about the perspective, right? Because as Americans, the idea of paying a 40 some percent tax rate, that seems crazy. So we we're talking about what do you get for your dollar? And she said, it really depends on your lifestyle. So she said, if you're single and don't have kids, doesn't feel fair. She's like, I'm paying for free college. My kids aren't going to go to college because I don't have kids. She's like, I'm paying for childcare. I don't have children. So she's like, I'm paying for things that I don't benefit from. Okay. Now, if you have a family, right, having free or reduced childcare sounds great. Having free college as a family, that sounds great, right? Because I have kids, so then I don't have to save for them to go to school. So a lot of times when you look at the services that some of these countries provide, it's, a, again, it's going to depend on who you talk to. Some people are going to value that, okay? But also, how might somebody else feel? What if you don't have kids? What if you don't? So that's always kind of a perspective you want to take with taxes is that, yes, the more you put in, the more you, quote, get as a civilization, but how are you personally going to benefit from that, you know? And so that often will change people's opinions, right? If I had a large family, 40% tax where all healthcare, childcare, and college is covered, I'm like, great. But what if I only have one child? What if I don't have children? You know, is that fair that I'm being taxed the same amount and I don't reap the benefits that a lot of those things come from? And I feel like both corners have a, have a point, right? I can see where both people are coming from, you know? So it's a very interesting perspective on um, sometimes when you look at countries that have higher tax rates, okay? So you get more for it, but there's also the other side of, is that fair? Is it fair to give up another 20% of my income for things that I am not utilizing? And again, that's gonna vary with opinion. So to check your understanding and mastery of the content, select the correct answer from this question. How would you describe the U.S. tax policy with regard to income in other countries? So I would say we're roughly in the middle, right? We're kind of middle of the pack, low 20s, okay? So the U.S. is in the middle when it comes to developed countries and taxation. All right, so make sure you're filling that out. We're going to keep going. Oh, actually, let me go over to our questions here. Oh, wait. I didn't share the right tab. I apologize. I was on the wrong tab. Okay. So we're going to answer this question right under the graph. How would you describe the U.S. tax policy with regards to taxing income based on the graph above? And we're kind of middle of the pack and then make sure that you submit that. All right. Let's go over to our... Um, so one of the characteristics of good tax is certainly... Um, okay. Is certainty, which includes knowing when taxes are due. When in when are income tax in the United States due? All right, anybody know? So, what's the general date? I got. Let me look up the twenty twenty four. Make sure it's the same because sometimes if it falls on a weekend, um, then okay, okay. So April fifteenth is usually the day, right? Um, and it's a Monday this year, so it will actually be the fifteenth. So sometimes, um. Sometimes like in 2022, it fell on a, it fell on a, on a, like a Saturday or Sunday. So then they, they bump it, they extend it to the next like business day um, is what will happen sometimes. Okay. So let me change this. So it's April 15th. So this year for 2023, um, they are due on, so you always file for the previous year. 
So like April 15th is for 2023 for the previous year. Okay. So 2023 taxes are due on April 15th, 2024. Okay. So here I'll put this in the chat. So April 15th is always the go-to day unless it falls on a weekend. And then sometimes um, they'll extend it again if it's like on a Saturday or a Sunday. Yes, go ahead, Ladybug. So how do, what does it mean when they give back taxes? So when they give back tax, that means that they took too much out of your check. So it's not like they're giving you money. They're just giving you back your money, basically. So, so what you do, that's a good question. So when you go to apply for a job, Okay. And you have to fill out your W-2. You want to try to fill it out as close to what the percentage you would owe. Because if they're taking out money every month, okay, you don't want to get to the end of the year and you still owe $5,000. I don't know about you, but having $5,000 just sitting around, like that's really stressful, right? So the goal is that what they're taking out is going to be as close as possible to what you owe. So sometimes you'll owe a little bit, or sometimes you might get a little bit back. So here's the rule of thumb. If you're give or take $500, so that means if you get a refund for $500 or you owe $500 or less. So if you get a refund for $500 or less, or if you owe $500 or less at the end of each year, that means that they're withholding just, just about the right amount from your check. Okay. Now, if you owe $5,000 at the end of the year, that means they're not withholding enough and you need to go in and make changes. Or let's say you get a big refund, right? There, You get back $3,000. That means they're taking too much every month. So you can go in and reduce that so they're taking less from each check. Does that make sense? It's kind of like making payments. And at the end of the year, they tally it all up and find your total. And let's see how close we were. That or is that really confusing? <laughs> that was just like they was giving you some type of free money the way people used to like make There's it. There's no, this is, it feels like that, but there is, like I said, back to my concept, right? Nothing is free, okay? The government does not give free money. So even when they gave the COVID checks, okay, we went further in debt and that's been rolled into future taxes. So we will pay for it in future taxes. Nothing is free nothing. So whenever somebody says free, you need to stop and say, no, somebody's paying for it somewhere. And likely it's you and I, we're paying for it. We might pay for it later, but it will get paid for Because where does the government get their money? Us, me and your parents and your guardians and you, as you start, like that's where they get their money. So when they quote, do something for us, it's not free. Somebody is paying for that. Somebody through their taxes. So when you get money back at the end of the tax year, that's just them refunding you your money because, right, they took it out of your check, right? The government's not that nice. <laughs> I think the government's just like, we just feel like we're going to have a lottery and Ladybug, you win and we're just going to send you free money. No, they're not that nice. They're not that nice. <laughs> they're not. They're, they will only send you your money and it's money you already paid. So it feels like you're getting free money because you never had it, right? They took it out of your check, but it's really just your money. So the goal when you file your taxes, you know that you're doing a good job as far as like being pretty accurate when you're give or take $500 owed or refund within $500. If it's more or less than $500, if it's more than $500 either way, then you're either overpaying or you're underpaying. Do you see what I mean? And the goal is to be close. So like this last year, I owed $260 at the end of the year. Now I had paid like all year, right? But that was the balance that we were short. And so that's pretty darn accurate, you know, when it's like, okay, like they're taking the right amount out of my check, out of my husband's check, out of, you know, like we're pretty darn close at the end of the year to what we will owe, meeting the, the debt, so to speak. All right. Good questions. And hopefully you find that interesting because it, it it's stuff that I didn't understand or realize until I was later in my 20s. Okay. We'll skip this video. Like I said, we're going to try to finish a little bit early today. All right. So there are two types of federal tax. Okay. There's individual tax that you and I pay, like I pay from my paycheck. And then there's corporate tax, which is business tax. Okay. So if your parents or guardian or somebody owns a business or if they work for a large company, that company or business pays its own taxes, okay? So there's two different entities that the federal government takes money from. They take money from every individual, all right? They're like, pay up, okay? 
So, and believe me, they'll never forget you. <laughs> all right. Um, and then you have the companies and the businesses that also pay taxes. All right. So there's two main ways that they, that they tax, they tax the individual and they tax corporations. Okay. There's two different views of corporate tax. So when corporate tax, we're talking about companies. Okay. So companies are important because they employ us, right? They provide jobs and income. They also, companies are important because they provide the goods and services that we need, right? If it's a car manufacturer or food, or if it's um, a doctor's office, like goods and services that we need. So we need corporations. We need companies, one, to employ us so we can make a living to pay for our house and, you know, our utilities and things like that. But we also need businesses because they provide the goods and services. So there's two different kind of theories toward taxing corporations. Okay. Today, um, so here's one theory. Today, large U.S. corporations report uh, more than a trillion dollars in cash or liquid assets. They have the funds to invest in new jobs should they choose to do so. We found no evidence that cutting the tax rate on corporate profits induced or induced firms to create new jobs. So there's one argument that says we shouldn't tax companies too much. If we let them have their extra money, if we don't take all their profits, they'll reinvest that maybe by opening another branch, expanding their production. They'll reinvest it into more jobs. And so one center is saying by letting companies hold on to their profits, uh, we don't find that they're actually creating more jobs. Here's the other point of view. American manufacturers are at a... Um, um, a distinct disadvantage to competitors headquarters of other countries. Specifically, foreign manufacturers uniformly face a lower corporate tax rate than U.S. manufacturers and virtually all operate under territorial systems which encourage investment both abroad and at home. So what this perspective is saying is if we're trying to create jobs, if we are going to charge the corporations more money to be in the United States versus putting their operations somewhere else, we're discouraging American jobs. So here's what I mean by that. Here's a great example. Think about um, car manufacturing. A lot of cars, Ford, that's a great example. So we'll just use Ford for an example. So Ford is an American company, right? That's all right. Ford's an American company, right? So Ford traditionally, historically has been produced in America. Well, in the last couple decades, they've started moving some of their plants, manufacturing plants, to what country? Anybody know what country? Where Ford? And they're not the only ones. China? Uh, not China. Close. South of the border. Korea? No, south of our border. Uh, uh, Canada Mexico. or Mexico? Mexico. Okay. Mexico. Canada, we usually don't move jobs to Canada because their tax rates are higher than ours. So we don't usually move. Okay. So you know why Ford moves or their reason for moving. So they, they've shut down car manufacturing plants, let's say in Detroit, and they move them down to Mexico. They claim because, and there's some truth to this, they pay less tax. It's true. They pay less tax if they open it in Mexico and they pay the workers less in Mexico. So one hand is saying, we need to tax these companies because even if we let them save the money, they're not going to create more jobs. The other one is saying, well, if you keep taxing them so much, they're going to close down plants, which means there goes, you know, oftentimes thousands and thousands of workers that work at a plant. Now, all those people are unemployed and they move it to another country to save money, which, yes, they bring employment there. But we're looking to try to bring employment here. Right. So there's kind of two heads to the stone of like we need to tax them because they have the money. But also if we tax them too much, they're going to go somewhere else where they can save money and not pay as much taxes. So it's a very hard balance when you come to the corporations because they are responsible for our goods, but also the jobs. So it's not just about taxes. It's about jobs. Right. And when you do that, what's the consequence of that? So it's a it's a hard balance to strike. OK. As you read individual income taxes, summarize the reasons that individuals essentially pay their taxes all throughout the year rather than all at once. And we do this through withholdings from our check, right? So we pay it every paycheck instead of just sending me a bill at the end of the year and saying, this is what I owe. OK, and here's why. So taxpayers um, have taxes withheld from their check throughout the year rather than face a large bill at the end of the year. Individuals would have to calculate and remember to either save that amount throughout the year or they would face a huge debt and possibly get in huge trouble. So it stinks having your taxes taken out. Well, this is number nine. It stinks having taxes taken out. But you're going to find how many of you are not good savers? Anybody? Any of you admitted spenders? If the federal government didn't take out 
think you'd have to sit there and calculate. So let's say you made a thousand dollars. You have to be like, okay, I'm probably taxed at 15%. So it means I need to put $150 aside every paycheck. Do you have enough discipline to do that? Do you see what I mean? Or like a lot of people, would you go spend it and be like, oh, next month I'll save it. Oh, next month. Do you see what I mean? So in the end, it's actually better for all of us that they take it out ahead of time. And if they take too much, then they refund it. Um, or if we if we still owe, then hopefully it's a smaller amount. Then at the end of the year, sending us a bill for $5,000 and we're like, oh my gosh, where am I going to get that money? Because a lot of people are not good at saving their money. You know, even if they know that they need to. Unfortunately, that's it's, it's a hard thing. Go ahead. I got just one quick question so how do people do like i don't want to say it's a scam but it is in a way a scam and it's illegal that people doing tax like fraud or oh, back, so like give tax you back money for your taxes at like they okay. have or something so so i think what you're talking about so what happens sometimes so i'll give an example um so my husband actually came in or he the local police don't deal with this but somebody called the police on it and then they had to turn it over to the fbi and then the irs so what happened was, is that this family, this family member found out that their cousin, so grandma had passed away like two years ago, right? So the family grandma had passed away. Okay. One family member found out that another family member, so like a cousin was still claiming grandma on their taxes. So even though grandma was dead, bless her soul, right? You know what I mean? They were still claiming that grandma was alive and that they were paying for her to get a tax deduction. So that people will do that sometimes people will like make up fake kids or claim dead people or double claim people and in doing that you get a refund right that you shouldn't be getting so that's where a lot of people like do tax fraud is either filing taxes in someone's name that isn't around or claiming people that don't exist like the more kids you have the more you can deduct okay so i have two kids but if i claimed i had four let me tell you, I get back a lot more money every year, but that would be fraudulent, right? So if I got caught, you know, I'd be in a world of her. So that's, does that make sense? Kind of, it's where they can claim they have expenses that they don't really have. Right. And yeah, so that's probably what you're kind of talking about. And that does happen. It happens more than we realize. So again, don't mess with the federal government. They're not nice, okay? They're not, they're not nice. Okay. Um, some of the biggest expenses of our, so what does the government spend their money on? The, 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 some of the biggest expenses, social security. So people pay into that, but when we retire, then we get a small check from the government each month to help with, uh, with that. Um, Medicare is a big expense. Okay. So these are for people that turn 65. One of the biggest expenses for people when they retire is healthcare. So Medicare is so helpful in that it, it's not necessarily free healthcare, but it's, it's like having an insurance policy. It's reduced healthcare, right? Reduced cost healthcare. So it's kind of like having insurance. Okay. Except it's provided by the government. So it's not free, but um, it helps that you're not paying full amounts. Cause if you go and try to get private insurance, it's so, so expensive. Um, so, so expensive. Okay. All right. Other national taxes. And we're going to do it. Let's do our last question on here. And then we're going to wrap this up. Okay. So it says number 10, individual and corporate income tax, federal tax page. So look at the tax schedule in figure 8.6. Okay. Did I miss that? Where's 8.6? Let me look here. Okay. They do not have those things scheduled. Where's, where is... 8.6, figure five, figure six. All right, let me find it. Here we go, figure eight, 8.6. Figure nine, okay, there is no 8.6. All right, we'll just figure it out together. Okay. <laughs> okay, look at the tax schedule. Assume you are a single person whom this schedule applies to. You make $40,000 a year. 
what would be your income uh what would be your income tax or what would your income tax be okay so looking at the schedule which um so it looks like it used to be there somebody edited this so i don't know where um where that tax schedule went but on the bracket being 36,000 to 87,000 as a single person um you would pay $4,901 plus 25% on um, on the income over $36,000 which would be um so 40,000 which would be okay so it looks like the first part So the first part up to, so if I get a calculator and I put in 36,250, okay, um, let's see, divided by 4991, so I'm just trying to find the percentage. Okay, so that percentage would be at 7%. So, no, that's more than that. It's like 15%. Okay, so 36,250, if up to that point at 15%, you're going to owe four thousand nine hundred and ninety one dollars but you make forty thousand dollars so what's left of that so thirty six thousand two hundred and fifty minus forty thousand thirty six thousand two fifty minus forty thousand oh my goodness my calculator is being okay forty thousand minus thirty six thousand two hundred and fifty so that leaves three thousand three thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars left at 25 percent so times 0.25 okay minus thirty six thousand okay times 0.25 it makes it at nine hundred and thirty seven dollars so we would pay 15 percent on the first thirty six thousand and then 25 percent on the remainder of that money Okay, which add those together. So 4,900 and 937 would come to a total owed. If I made $40,000 would come to a total owed of $5,928. Um, so I'll put this here in the chat for you. And that is number 10. And let me pinpoint these. I already did number nine. All right, so I'll give you a minute. Okay, once you have that one done, then go ahead for the rest. You can either delete or just put do not do. Okay, so you can either erase 11, 12, 13, 14, or you can just put do not do, okay? Okay, so your notebook should be done. If you were with me yesterday, with me today, then your notebook is good. And so you can either erase them or you can just put the do not do. All right, give me a thumbs up once you've done that. We have a couple more pages and then we're going to be done. We got to, I think there's one or two questions left in the course arcs. So we'll make sure we finish that. Okay. All right. So federal, we pay that through our taxes, we, or sorry, we pay that through our paychecks, and that pays for a lot of communal things that we enjoy, right? Okay, so Social Security, Medicare, when we get older, uh, defense, education, um, first responders, our highways, so a lot of the big picture things across all the states. Then we have state taxes. So in our state, we pay sales tax, right? So we have 8.2, I think it's 8.23, 8.25% on anything we buy other than medication and groceries. We pay on top of, and that's how the state brings in money, okay? So the state makes a lot of money off of that. And then locally, we see the state bringing in money through um, property taxes, through our utilities. Every time you go get gas from the gas pump, um, your electric bill, your water bill, your gas bill, the gas bill just went up. Um, here this last month and stuff. And some of that was taxes, fees that they're putting in there because the government wants more money. 
and it doesn't feel good when you get that bill that's for sure okay so here's a quick recap of local taxes and revenues um and then i think we got one or two more pages and then we're done what do you love most about your city good parks safe streets clean that water too. henderson who has tons of parks vegas services? has a lot of parks that well, comes from us. taxes that's right we're the taxpayers and we pay for those services when you live or shop in a city these same taxes also go to your schools, the county, the state. In fact, your city only gets a small portion of the property and sales tax collected within its limits. City revenues go to the operating budget, where the council funds things like police and fire, parks and recreation, planning, streets and sidewalks. These services aren't cheap. Police and fire alone can take up half the city budget. But what about the city utility systems like water and sewer? Who pays for that? Customers. Their money goes to that service and it can't be used for anything else, like a new park that residents want. And in case you were thinking that the state and federal government pays for some of those services, well, there's not much money there. Their support of cities has dwindled. Overall, city revenues may increase in strong economic times, but they also decrease when things aren't so good. During the downturn, cities work to minimize impacts on the public. But that creates challenges even when the economy recovers and especially when population grows. Cities are also working to enhance the services residents want, like faster public safety response time, reduced traffic, and better parks. This poses a budget problem today and into the future. Vibrant cities need reliable and stable revenue. We all need to work together to ensure that we can fund the many things we love about our cities. This is why it's so important to vote in your local elections, who your mayor is, who your city council is. It's so easy to get wrapped up in the presidential race. Is it going to be Biden or, or Trump? Is it going to be, you know, and like we get so wrapped up in that when actually in our day to day lives, it's the mayor, it's the city council. They will have a much bigger impact on your pocketbook, on your parks, on your roads, on your first responders, on how your life quality is within your city where they spend the money, how they spend the money, what policies they do or do not have, the quality of the park. Someday if you have kids or if you have kids, you know, like I appreciate parks now on a whole new level. Part of what I like about living in Henderson is there's parks everywhere and they're well maintained um, because when you have kids, you want them to be able to go play. You know, I don't want to go to a park that's run down or that's broken or that has trash everywhere. Like, so you appreciate where your money's going. You know, you appreciate that, okay, it takes money to have this, but there's a certain quality of life, um, which is nice. And I think everybody wants, everybody wants a nice quality of life and to have, to feel safe and to feel like things are clean and to feel like they can use the roads and the parks and the, the services, right? That they are there to accommodate them. Um, but it takes money. And the policies that our politicians pass or don't pass or change, um, have a huge impact on that. And I don't think I ever really quite appreciated how impactful that was. All right, let's go to summary. I believe we are done. Look at that. We are done. Okay. So we went through, let me just double check real quick, make sure I didn't miss any questions here. We hit the questions kind of randomly. Okay. We did this one middle. Let me make sure there wasn't any others. Just make sure, because I know I bounced back and forth a little bit looking for the 8.6 that I never found. So. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think we got them all. I think we got them all. Oh, here we go, sorry. There is one on, this is the federal spending page. So three from the bottom, see that? So make sure you go to that page. There is one question there that I missed. Let's do that one really quick. Roughly how much um, larger as a share of GDP will Medicare cost uh, be in 2080 compared to 2010? So Medicare meaning medical retirement, okay? So medical retirement. So basically as our population increases, how much more money is the government gonna have to spend to provide Medicare? The more people that retire, the more money it costs for the government. So the more money that has to go into it. So in 2010, it's showing about three and a half percent GDP. 
okay? And by 2080, it's showing about six and a half. So it's almost double. So just short of double. Um, we're going to see the expense due to aging population and population growth. So that's a big one. Social Security will be the same thing. As our population grows and more people retire, then that's more money that has to go into that. All right. Awesome. Okay. So we should be done with um, the notebook. So go ahead and you can turn this in. The course arc should be done. All right. So you should have two out of the three things done for this week. 9.4 course arc should be done. And then the notebook should be done. So remember, you can go and you can submit that on the 9.4 page right here. Okay. You can submit your notebook and get that in. All right. Um, let me give you the review sheet for 9.4 and then I'll give you about 10 minutes um, to just get make sure stuff submitted and then we'll be done for the day. All right, so here is 9.4 review sheet. You can also find this on the lesson and recording page. Oh wait, it's not letting me do it. Okay, there it is. So go ahead and click on that. Okay, so it has your key vocab words. And then again, kind of going through each area, key questions um, and sections, some of the key graphs, helping understand how taxes work. This is a long one because it's a long section. So I definitely pulled some of the graphs, okay, um, and stuff like that going through. So you can see all the additional questions. I put some additional questions on here. So um, so these aren't necessarily in the course arc, but these are ones that I thought would be good for you to study, okay, that I pulled from the test bank. So there are some additional questions at the end that you would wanna take a look at, all right? Um, you can tell the questions from the course arc because they'll have the question and then it'll be highlighted. So like here's the last one that we did based on that graph. based on the graph. And then there's some additional questions at the end that I pulled from the test bank um, that would be good to review. All right. So as always, you're welcome to use this when you take your um, quiz. Um, you just have to let the proctor know. And if you want to adjust it, you do make a copy and you can make a copy and you can make adjustments to it if you like to highlight things or do anything um, extra special with those. Okay. If you want to do anything extra special. Any questions? Give me a thumbs up if you're going to get your notebook in. Course arc done. You got your review sheet. So that means for this weekend or going into this weekend. Oops. Here we go. Okay. So that means that for this weekend, um, course arc, notebook, and the quiz are all due on Monday. Or not Monday, sorry, Tuesday the 20th. Tuesday the 20th. So you can see them here. Okay. The zombie apocalypse project is closing on Monday, okay? So that's a huge grade. Um, if you've not turned that in, I would definitely make sure that we are, um, make sure that you are um, getting the, that in because that is a huge one that you need to have in, all right? And then 9.3 is still open as well, all right? So if you're behind, if you need to improve your grade, zombie apocalypse, get that in. All right. And that you can find those on their lesson recording page, right? We literally did the entire project in class. 9.3, we did the course arc and the notebook in class, right? Notes for the quiz. You can find those on the live session page. And then same with this, the course arc notebook we did together and then um, gave you the notes for the quiz. So you just need to do the notes independently. All right. Any questions? We're good. Any questions? As always, you can come see me um, for small group from 9 to 11. Um, code is on the homepage and I send that I send, you know, I put it in my Friday announcements um, and stuff. So if you are personally, if you're struggling with one or if you need to go over something on, um, then that's why you come to small group. All right. So we're going to hang out for about 10 minutes. I can't let you go this early. Make sure you get your stuff in. Um, you can review and then I'll let you go a few minutes early. Okay. I'm going to stop recording though so that it's not keep going.